Pete's and uh, congrats on getting to the final four. I know you've been focused on the game in front of you to this point, but as a PA guy, what does it mean to be back in Philly for the for championship weekend where, you know, it all ended for you your first year? Yeah, it's definitely really cool being able to go back to Pennsylvania. I think it's a little better uh, set up than Hartford, Connecticut. Um, you know, a lot of people, I think there's gonna be a lot of people at the game. And I know talking to my parents, um, that we have a lot of friends and family coming too. Um, so it will be definitely really cool to just to see them and have a really cool atmosphere. Uh, I'm an Eagles fan myself. So I think it'd be cool to be at the Eagle stadium to, you know, start 2019 and now in, in the end of my career here. For both of you guys, if you can go back, just, uh, Jack Simmons as a teammate, uh, you guys came in with him. Uh, what was your relationship with him? What do you remember about him uh, as a player and also just as a, a, a guy? Yeah, we're best friends with him still. We talk to him daily, weekly, uh, bust his balls a little bit. But, um, you know, he's, he's a good friend of ours. We stay in touch. He, he lived with me, Xander, and Petey. Uh, and then Evans in took over his spot. So we're in a four-man apartment. Uh, and I think people are living with him next year. They're on the team now. So. Uh, we definitely have a really close relationship. Our parents are close. Um, it was fun playing against them, you know, two times. We kind of give them hell a little bit, but, um, you know, we'll be talking to them and, you know, hope the best for, for him. But, you know, obviously that gets put aside on game day. Yeah, I think Sal nailed it. I'm sitting in uh, Simmons' old room last year, so <laughs> we definitely miss him. We're definitely still really close to them. I think watching him have three and one last game was a little bittersweet because he just was on fire. but. At the same time, we're so happy for him that he's crushing it over there in South Bend. So I think we're definitely looking forward to playing him. And I think he's probably just thinking the same thing. Thank you. Yeah, again, for both of you guys, uh, played Notre Dame twice already this season, including at the end of the regular season. How hard is it to, or how much do you all talk about, you know, having to try and beat an opponent for a third time in a, in a season? Yeah, it really hasn't been brought up much yet. Um, you know, I think we've had their number over the last few years, and they know that, and we know that. But I think when it comes to the Final Four, all that's thrown out the window. And, you know, what you've done throughout the regular season doesn't matter. Your wins, your losses. Um, you know, I think the heightened stage kind of gets rid of all that, and I think it's a pretty even playing field. So it just matters how you show up on that day. Yeah, couldn't agree more. From an offensive perspective, it's – it really doesn't matter what happened the last two games. I think the first game of offense will be put on a great showing, 15 goals in South Bend. It's tough to do. And then last game of the clock, there, I think you saw our defense hold them to eight goals, and Matt Noons, I think, was 70% that day. So sort of the two different tales there, but I think I think no one's really thinking about those games. I'm sure their locker room saying the same things, that it doesn't matter, which it doesn't. Um, whoever's playing your best across right now is who's going to hold the trophy up on Monday. So I think – those games sort of we can learn a lot from them schematically we'll go over them and steal some things left and right but I think this is just who's who could put together the better game David Jeff and then Mike Grayson how much interaction is there among athletes from the different sports and when you see say men's tennis win the natty the other day uh, do you draw inspiration motivation from that yeah, I don't know anyone on the tennis team, but I, you know, I obviously saw that they won and back-to-back -back champions, which is pretty cool. Um, you know, I think it is pretty inspiring just how many national championships have come to the University of Virginia, and, and that's kind of what we harp on here at the university is national championships, not so much ACC titles or regular season titles. Um, so I think, you know, the praise that they get after winning a national championship is something that we're always chasing. Xander, in the regular season, you guys played Duke twice, you played Notre Dame twice, you played Maryland, you played Hopkins, Michigan. I think strength of schedule ended up being number one. How much do you think that has helped prepare you for what you have faced and what you will face in the NCAA tournament? Immensely. I, I think that's huge. I think, one, that's the reason you come to Virginia to play in those games. You want to play the best. Two, there's sort of certain types of games. We had a game against Lafayette, who's a decent program, but they're not in the same categories as Blue Bloods you mentioned. And with that, you get to sort of get some younger guys in, get guys more experience, and those games are really good for sort of the whole program as a whole, top to bottom. But I think when you're playing Dukes and Notre Dame's Maryland's consistently, I think teams like that are able to sort of highlight some of your weaknesses that other teams that 
like Lafayette maybe can and maybe can't really emphasize what you really need to work on well like the best of the best out there can sort of show that like maybe you're not as good as you thought you were at a certain thing at a certain man up man down whatever it may be so games like those I think just allow you to be like all right we need to sort of reset and maybe sort of a little humble I guess uh, sort of like check our humbleness on that so I think teams like that sort of allow us to just sort of realize that we're not where we need to be and then come May hopefully we put it all together for both of you guys, uh, kind of following up on what Preston was asking about the, the third matchup, Coach Tiffany said that the key is to tweak things, change things, so they look different for your opponent, but they don't feel different for you guys. Um, as veteran players, how easy is it to adjust to a little tweak or a little change here um, without it feeling like a new offense or defense? Yeah, I think yeah. – um, I think that – that's a pretty good way of putting it. Um, but I think Lars has been talking about how, you know, our, our team's experience has allowed us to make those minor adjustments and minor changes and maybe practice it once or twice throughout the week and not have to harp it, you know, seven, eight, nine times where it's taking an hour or two a week away from other things. Um, so I think our experience has allowed us to really, um, you know, take those minor changes and just go with them and, and be able to do it on the fly. Um, which is you know pretty special and something that I don't even you don't even think about as a player. But then when the coaches mention it, you're like, oh yeah, I guess you know you know two years ago we might have needed to spend an hour on this. Now we can spend five minutes uh, just talking through it. Yeah, gods of side. Um, I think guys are so much experience sort of under a lot better than maybe some younger teams that so the take coach Kerwin is telling us hey, sliding the Jason they're sliding fire hot here um and we kind of know what that means now we understand how to how to counter so it does save us a lot of time so long so that's a lot thank you all right uh Zach and Patrick and then Jeff Grayson, uh, Notre Dame is, is one of a couple of teams that this year forced PD to win the ball back and then look to try to ride um, the ball from you guys. What have you seen from him and the team in general sort of adjusting to that and, and being maybe a little bit more, maybe not cautious, but but sort of willing to win the ball back and, and, and try to clear the ball that way rather than trying to push a transition and, and uh, yeah, win. win yeah. The yeah, I think teams have, you know, created a strategy that have, because PD is so dangerous, in the transition game, I think they've you know started to create a strategy where they're dropping their wings and being more defensive, um, and then you know having the D midi on attack at times so they can rush from behind when they start the ride. Um, but yeah, I think we've done a great job adjusting to that throughout the year. I think at first it was a little different, but we've been able to adjust, um, and I think we've done a great job. You know, PD obviously wants to go forward and and win you know face offs and great transition like he did in the beginning of the Georgetown game. But I think you know we have to take what's available, and he's done better and better with that throughout the year um, and has really allowed us to get the ball to our offense and then, you know, have them do the scoring. Go ahead, Patrick. Xander, I have a question for you about Grayson and the comeback that he's made and the leadership that he's provided this season. Uh, how would you kind of size up how remarkable that, that comeback was from the injury last year and just what has he meant to you guys as a program, not just this season, but, but also over the last several seasons? He's my roommate. Maybe I'll go grab him. <laughs> I know he's having technical difficulties. Um. Xander, we got you now. Yeah, can you hear me? Or yeah. not? Yeah. All right. Do you want uh, me to ask that again? Yeah, sorry, I did not hear so, the question. That's okay. Uh, I was asking a bit about Grayson, um, and you know what the comeback that he made from injury last year. Uh, what what were kind of your impressions of of how effective he was in doing that, and the leadership he's provided, and, and just the value he's given to the program here over the course of his career. Yeah, I'm, I'm really glad you asked that. I've seen some articles here and there about it, but it, it really was remarkable watching that, how quick it was. I remember when we were younger hearing stories about how fast Ryan Connor was able to return from injury, and, and it was like 
sort of a, a superhero story. And then here comes Grayson did it faster than Conrad did it. And it kind of went under the radar just because that's who Grayson is. And that's sort of, he was just humble. And we were actually roommates after the season ended in Washington, D.C. So I was able to see why it was so quick because every day I'd come home from work and he would just be on the ground doing all of his workouts, doing all of his PT. And he would go to these facilities. And it was like whenever I saw him, when we weren't working at our offices, he was doing physical therapy. He was getting back and he was very quiet about it. And I kind of knew like, oh, my God, he's going to come back really quick. Like he's got a look in his eye like he does not want to sit out much longer. And it's really just remarkable. And I think I'm sure the fall was a little more difficult for him not being able to be out on the field with us because we're very competitive people and we like to play. And as a captain, it's sort of hard to lead when you're not really out there playing. But I think he learned sort of the art of almost leading, not by example, which is kind of what you want to do, but sort of leading from the side and, and making his voice more heard, I think. And I think it allowed him to sort of be a better captain. Here we are now in late May. And I think he sort of was able to, to balance both leading by example and using his voice. So I think it, it worked out well. And I'm really proud and impressed with how he was able to recover from that. I was going to say, how, how, you know, how appreciative and amazed was everybody when you get to February 11th and there he is out there on the field playing in the season opener? It was crazy. Not only was he out there on the field, but like weeks before he was out there in the field in the drills in 6v6 in practice, like fully going. Everyone's like, okay, Grayson's on the field. Be careful. And it's like, no, Grayson's hitting you. Grayson's covering you, trapping you, taking the ball from you, running the other way. I was like, what the heck? I thought he was hurt right now. So I think everyone was in shock and everyone was super excited because we know that was a huge piece of our team we needed back. So it was, it was really awesome to see. Thank you. Grayson, you've been with uh, Matthew Nunes now on the field and in defensive meetings for two seasons. What changes have you seen in him in his second year in the program from his first? Yeah, I think, um, you know, he's been a leader on the defense since he stepped on on campus here. So, you know, in regards, some things haven't changed. And I think that's a really good thing because he's stayed very neutral, whether he's playing, you know, his best lacrosse or whether he's having a tough day. Uh, I think he's been able to stay kind of neutral with, you know, how he goes about his business, which I think is, you know, tremendous and is how you have to deal with things and you can't take the highs too high and the lows too low. Um, but I think he's also been able to grow, you know, you know, being able to lead the defense more and more and with the clear and saving balls. And, you know, it's been it's been good to watch him develop uh, over the last year and a half, two years. Xander, you guys have been one of the best offenses in the nation um, all season, and now Connor is healthy and playing uh, at a better level. Um, how much better or different is your offense right now, maybe, um, than it was when when he wasn't practicing or was limited? Yeah, it's different, and it, I think it's it should be pretty scary for opponents to see what happened last game. I think you mentioned it. We were the number one offense statistically – all season long. And I think that's a credit to coach Kerwin and obviously the guys in the locker room, but just the mind of him is such an advantage for us and, and how dedicated he is to watching film and, and showing us and really allowing us to sort of be at our best. And we did that with Connor was really hurt and Connor was really quiet about it because that's who he is. And now when Connor's healthy, it should be absolutely terrifying for defensive coordinators. I mean, it means you have to slide more and we need to slide more. You have to recover more. You need to recover more. You have to find more core. Yeah, and I are inside. And I think that's where we're at our best is when defenses have to slide because it's Connor Shelburne who's coming on the corner. And then you have the inside game. And then you have stepping on shooters like Peter Garno, McConvey, Schutz, Ricky, who are hitting their stride right now. So I think last game you saw everyone sort of playing at their peak. And if that happens, it's just, it's really, really tough offense to stop, I think. Is it a little remarkable to think about how good you guys were offensively, even when he was limited? Does that kind of show just how much? talent there is on this offense I think it is I think we kind of that was almost the expectation though because we did like I remember the preseason there's a lot of talk of like a lot of mouths to feed in the offense how are we going to figure this out like how is everyone going to be sort of content with their roles so I think everyone knew like we should be this good we have to be this good and, and it's up to coach Kerwin to figure out how to make us this good and we weren't before the season started we were actually struggling a lot as Grace remembers we had two scrimmages and we were not scoring a lot of goals and then coach Kerwin I don't know what he did, but he, he figured everything out like he always does. And I think we really clicked. So I think it is impressive we were able to do it without Connor, but the offense is just so – like the culture of it is so selfless and the ball movement so strong this year that we kind of understood if one person goes down, like we just think of ourselves as an 18-wheeler, Kerwin says, and just another wheel. So I think we were able to sort of persevere through that. And now having Connor back is, is going to be really, really scary. Awesome. Thank you. Zach and David, and then we'll wrap up. 
Grayson, I think back in, in 2021 against UNC in the semis, you had what could be called a breakout game on the wings of faceoffs on defense. Obviously, lots of guys on this team have had similar performances in championship weekend throughout the tournament. How much of that sort of experience and, and having been there before do you guys value? Is that something that's talked about? Like, How does that impact this team now going looking for a third championship in, in four post seasons? Yeah, I think, you know, the experience definitely helps. Um, we don't talk about, you know, how to play, really, because I think that's kind of drilled in everyone's head, you know, when they step on on campus here. But I think more like of the minor details, people asking, you know, questions about timings of things or, you know, we have interviews, where we do headshots. You know, it's like different things that the older guys have experienced that we're allowed to, you know, that we're able to tell the younger guys. Uh, and then as far as, you know, on the field things, I think you kind of, it just kind of comes second nature, um, you know, with people like Noah out there getting ground balls and, and our defense with Caden Cole and Griffin and Hugh, uh, everyone having experience there besides Griffin. Um, so I think, you know, the experience is definitely something we're going to lean on, but I don't think you talk about it too much to the point where, um, you know, you try to replicate uh, what happens, but you're trying to, you know, take the positives from what you've, what you did in the past and, and propel you forward now. Grayson, you mentioned earlier that national championships are the standard at Virginia. Is that something that comes from the coaching staff or is it more passed on from cl class to class among the athletes? Yeah, I think that's definitely, you know, for our program, I think it's more class to class. I remember John Fox saying we don't hang banners for final four appearances like a lot of other schools do. Uh, we only hang banners for national championships. Um, so I think that's something that's stuck in all of our minds throughout the years um, that, you know, not that it's a failure if you don't win a national championship, but, you know, that's our expectation every year is to make that game and make that, make that run um, that people will remember. So I think, you know, ultimately it comes down to the players and uh, previous classes. But I think the coaches have started to pick up on that, you know, ACC titles aren't what we're here for, um, which is a pretty, you know, we hold ourselves to such a high standard. And that's, you know, as a kid and as a recruit coming in, that's what you hope for. And that's, you know, why you play the game is to play in these big games. So 